Hi everyone. As discussed in previous lectures, the second industrial revolution, as well as the increase of urbanization and immigration at the end of the 19th century, led to new calls for reform within American society. The result was the progressive movement, which was actually a collection of reforms spearheaded by primarily by middle class Americans dwelling in cities, which called for the government to take a greater role in fixing the problems facing society. In today's lecture, I will examine how the progressive movement impacted social issues and relationships within the United States. So the second industrial revolution had created new class divisions within American society. A new millionaire class was born after the Civil War that controlled more personal wealth than previously seen in history. These captains of industry, such as Andrew Carnegie, accumulated fortunes that would be worth hundreds of billions of dollars in today's money. However, there was a stark difference between the living conditions of, say, the Vanderbilts, who resided in opulent mansions such as Biltmore, and more working class Americans who crowded into slums of major cities like New York and Chicago. The problems of living conditions in cities were spotlighted by photojournalist and muckraker Jacob Reese. Reese used flash, uh, flash powder to capture the crowded, dark, and dangerous living conditions facing people living in tenements, many of whom were newly arrived immigrants. In his 1890 book, How the Other Half Lives, Reese opened the eyes of middle and upper class Americans to the underside of city living. During the process of urbanization, poorer Americans had been crammed into dumbbell tenement houses that were largely unregulated and poorly maintained. These dumb, dumbbell tenements had been designed to pack as many people as possible into a very small living space. They were designed with a shaft that ran through the building, which was supposed to give people access to fresh air and light. However, in reality, only one room in each apartment was directly exposed to sunlight and open air, and the air sh shaft often filled with garbage, leaving a terrible stench that emanated through the entire building. This poor ventilation proved to be deadly, not only because the air shaft made it easier for fires to spread from one tenement to another, but also because it spread diseases such as cholera, yellow fever, and tuberculosis. There was no plumbing in these tenements either. Oftentimes, residents of New York's tenements would be forced to share a single bathroom, and in some cases, only outhouses were available. Modern sewage systems were in their infancy, and the result was cities at the turn of the century that were drowning in their own waste and feces. So the progressive era sought to improve the living conditions in cities, which impacted the poorest classes of Americans more acutely. Some of the earliest attempts to improve living conditions can be seen in the settlement house movement that gained popularity in the 1890s. The most famous advocate of the settlement house movement was Jane Addams, who established Hull House in Chicago in 1889. Settlement houses provided services to many Americans who resided in poorer urban neighborhoods, and they were especially important for providing services to immigrants. Hull House, for example, offered English language instruction, as well as counseling service for services for new immigrants, child care for working mothers, and even cultural activities and games for children. As a progressive, Jane Addams also pushed for more playgrounds and safe spaces for children. She lobbied for the creation of kindergartens, and she pressured local governments to take more responsibility for trash collection. In New York City, George Waring pioneered sanitation and trash collection services. In 1895, Waring became the head of the Department of Street Cleaning, which had been established in 1881, but had been rendered ineffective as a result of the corruption from political machines such as Tammany Hall. Waring installed the first system for organized cleaning of New York City streets, uh, which included garbage pickup and street sweeping. Gradually, all major cities began to invest in modern sewage systems and new methods of trash collection. During this time period, Chicago also stands out for its use of engineering in order to improve living conditions. Like many other cities, Chicagoans would regularly dump their waste and sewage into the local rivers. The heavily polluted Chicago River would carry sewage into Lake Michigan, which was the source of the the city's drinking water. In 1900, Chicago reversed the flow of the Chicago River in order to decrease pollution in Lake Michigan. In addition to improved sanitation, the progressive movement also sought to use government regulation to improve the conditions of tenements. The nation began to pass building codes that created standards for the construction of housing in urban areas. The Tenement Housing Act of 1901 was a New York law that outlawed dumbbell tenements, set size requirements for housing, and mandated that tenement housing be built with indoor plumbing and central courtyards.
Now, another major goal of the progressive era was to improve morality within society. Many progressives had become concerned by the growth of vices within the cities, including gambling, prostitution, and alcoholism. Additionally, the rise of crime moved many progressives to action. Perhaps the most obvious attempt by progressives uh, in order to reform and improve morality was the temperance movement, which steadily gained popularity and power throughout the late 1800s and in the early 1900s as well. Corner saloons for many progressives became associated with corruption and the moral decay of the cities. Militant organizations such as the Women's Christian Temperance Union and the Anti-Saloon League were created to combat the threat posed by these saloons and the alcohol that they served. The movement had a great deal of success during this time period, and many states and counties passed dry laws, which imposed greater regulations in some cases and even outright banned alcohol in others. Still, most cities remained wet and allowed alcohol consumption, largely because they had large immigrant populations that were accustomed to the free flow of alcoholic beverages in their former countries. These cities would continue to allow alcohol until the passage of the 18th Amendment in 1919, which banned the manufacture, sale, and transportation of intoxicating liquors. Progressive reforms such as the Settlement House Movement and the Temperance Movement were often spearheaded by women, and indeed the progressive movement had a large impact on gender roles within society. Women were a leading force for change within the progressive era. Inspired by the social gospel, many women became more politically active during this time period. Now, the progressive era coincided with the growth in the women's club movement, and many middle-class women joined local groups that sought to tackle social issues. The General Federation of Women's Clubs was founded in 1890 to bring together over 3,000 local women's organizations across the United States and promote civic activities. So during this time period, women were still heavily restricted by the idea of the cult of domesticity, which stated that separate spheres existed within American society for both men and women. Women were expected to remain in the home and take care of the children. However, women during this time period used the cult of domesticity in order to try to gain more political power, arguing that women's traditional roles as moral protectors made their voices essential to local and national issues and necessitated the power to vote. Women pressed for women's suffrage, and the progressive era was marked by the rise of new suffrage organizations, such as the National American Women's Suffrage Association, or NASA, and the more militant National Women's Party. Together, these organizations were able to gain the right to vote for women by 1920 with the passage of the 19th Amendment. The role of women changed in other ways during the progressive era as well. The second industrial revolution had brought millions of women into the workforce for the first time. However, strict social codes limited the types of jobs that women were allowed to hold. A vast majority of women workers were single since the cult of domesticity made employing wives taboo. Married women often then took jobs in factories and sweatshops out of necessity. White collar women were able to take jobs as secretaries, social workers, clerks, and telephone operators. The job opportunities were even more limited for black women and newly arrived immigrants. In general, working women faced long hours, lower pay than men, and fewer opportunities for economic advancement. The progressive movement sought to create greater protections for these female workers. Now, Florence Kelly, uh, who assumed control of the National Con uh, Consumer League in 1899, pushed for laws that provided more protections for women and children in the workplace. In 1908, the Supreme Court ruled in Mueller v. Oregon that laws protecting women were indeed constitutional. The court reasoned that these laws were necessary because they viewed women as biologically weaker than men and in need of protection from the harmful effects of work. Now, this ruling would later be viewed as highly discriminatory, and it would actually be used to justify keeping women out of certain male-dominated professions. But at the time, the Mueller v. Oregon case was viewed as a major victory for progressivism and the protection of women in the workplace. During the progressive era, there was increasing conflict over sexual attitudes in America, especially when it came to women. In the 1890s, increased female employment offered women a greater degree of independence, and young single women often headed to dance halls and nightclubs when their working day was done. A new morality emerged during the progressive era that ref was reflected with increased rates of divorce, greater openness about sexual topics, and calls for birth control. Margaret Sanger was a feminist who founded the birth control movement and fought to give women legal access to contraceptives, which were illegal at the time and considered obscene. She opened the first birth control clinic in 1916, and her early clinics would eventually become the Planned Parenthood Federation of America and lead a greater cause for female productive rights in the 1920s.
Of course, one of the greatest failures of the progressive movement was its inability to address the social problems facing African Americans at the turn of the century. The New South, which had emerged following the end of Reconstruction, had stripped away the voting rights of many African Americans through the use of poll taxes, literacy tests, and voter intimidation. It also implemented its segregation laws in almost all public settings, the constitutionality of which were confirmed by the Plessy v. Ferguson case in 1896. So not only did the progressive movement not push to end Jim Crow laws in the South, but in some cases it actively promoted discrimination. For example, as part of the women's club movement, the United Daughters of the Confederacy was organized in Nashville in 1894. The United Daughters of the Confederacy helped rewrite the history of the Civil War, promoting the idea of the lost cause and forming textbook committees that lobby to have a pro-Confederate version of the Civil War taught in many schools. This version of, of history de-emphasized the role that slavery played in the lead up to the Civil War and instead replaced it with ideas about states' rights. In addition, the United Daughters of the Confederacy helped to fund the construction of Confederate monuments across the country, many of which still stand today. Now, the progressive era was a collection of many movements, and so it would be unfair to broadly label it as racist. Indeed, there were white progressives who fought for greater equality within society, like Jane Addams. But it is important to understand that many progressives believed in social Darwinism and ideas of white superiority. Thus, the exclusion of African Americans from many progressive reforms meant that they had to create a movement of their own within that time period. Figures such as Ida B. Wells used the power of the press in order to campaign against lynchings and Jim Crow laws. In the 1890s, there were a record number of blacks who were killed by lynch mobs for challenging segregation laws and asserting their equality. Ida B. Wells used her newspaper, the Memphis Free Press, to speak out against these lynchings and expose the ideology of white supremacy that underlied these killings, even at the risk of her own life. Meanwhile, Booker T. Washington emerged as one of the most important civil rights figures during this time period. As the head of the Tuskegee Institute, Washington believed that improving the economic conditions of African Americans would eventually lead to greater equality and mutual respect among races. In his Atlanta Compromise speech, Booker T. Washington urged African Americans to accept segregation in the short term in order to pursue better education and job opportunities. In the long run, he believed that economic equality would lead to greater political and social social equality throughout America. However, not everyone agreed with his more accommodationist approach, and other leaders emerged that argued for different approaches to racial equality. Key among these leaders was W.E.B. Du Bois, a black scholar, writer, and activist from Massachusetts. Du Bois believed Washington's approach to equality would doom African Americans to a system of perpetual inequality. Instead, he demanded that African Americans receive full and immediate social and political equality. He began to by creating the Niagara Movement in 1905, which called for an end to segregation and discrimination in unions, public facilities, and in America's justice system. While the Niagara Movement didn't have a major impact on state or federal legislation, it did lead to the creation of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or the NAACP, three years later in 1908. The NAACP was founded by the Niagara Movement as well as a group of white progressives, including Jane Addams. Its goal was to abolish all forms of segregation. The NAACP would become one of the most important civil rights organizations of the 20th century, conducting legal challenges to Jim Crow laws and fighting for racial equality.